everyone and a welcome in. It's Monkey Mar. Before we get into today's video, please make sure you click that subscribe button and that like to get all my notifications. And with that guys, let's get into Women Who Kill Children Episode 2, Diane Downs. <music> Diane Downs, a.k.a. Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson Downs. So, this was probably one of the first stories I can remember hearing about a mother who killed her children, well, her child, but attempted to kill all three of them. So, let's get into Diane Downs. August 7th, 1955, Diane Downs was born in Phoenix, Arizona. Two parents, Wesley Linden and Willadine Engel Fredrickson. She has testified that her father sexually abused her when she was 12 years old. Diane graduated from Moon Valley High School in Phoenix, where she met her husband, Steve Downs. After high school, she enrolled at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College in Orange, California, but was expelled after only one year of promiscuous behavior and soon returned to her parents' home in Arizona. It is amazing the similarities that you will hear throughout these six women in my first series of women who kill children so she's an American woman she was convicted of the murder of her daughter and attempted murder of her other two children in May 1983 so I was what 12 in 83 Following the crimes, she told police a man had attempted to carjack her and had shot the children. She was convicted in 1984 and sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years. And I'll tell you what, jail has not done justice to Diane Downs. All right, let's get a little backstory on Diane Downs. So, November 13th, 1973, she married Steve Downs after running away from home. Their first child, Christy Ann, was born in 1974. Cheryl Lynn followed in 76. And Stephen Daniel in 79. The couple divorced in 1980 because Steve thought Stephen Daniel, known as Danny, was the result of an affair Diane had on May 8, 1982. Downs gave birth to a daughter through surrogacy. She named the child Jennifer before turning her over to her intended parents. Before her arrest, Downs was employed by the United States Postal Service, assigned to the mail routes in the city of Cottage Grove, Oregon. Cheryl Lynn, shortly before her death, reportedly told a neighbor of her grandparents that she was afraid of her mother. Yeah, they really have a lot of dissimilarities in personalities and things that they say and make up. And these women are just definitely cut from the same cloth. Why are the same? I don't know what it is. So on May 19, 1983, Downs shot her three children and drove them in a blood-spattered car to Mackenzie Williamette Hospital. Upon arrival, Cheryl, aged seven, was already dead. Danny, aged three, was paralyzed from the waist down, and Christy, aged eight, had suffered a disabling stroke. Downs herself had been shot in the left arm. It was like a superficial 
wound. She claimed she was carjacked on a rural road near Springfield, Oregon by a strange man who shot her and the children. However, investigators and hospital workers became suspicious because they decided her manner was too calm for a person who had experienced a, such a traumatic event. She also made several attempts, excuse me, several statements that both police and hospital workers considered highly inappropriate. Now, I'm not sure if you saw the interview that she gave afterwards where she was reacting the incident with her sling on, but I am going to attach a link to that in the description because if you haven't, it's a must see. And they always seem to have like a love interest or a crush or a new boyfriend. Well, the first one, Casey Anthony, she had a new boyfriend that she moved in with, but I'm not sure if that is the reason why Kaylee ended up in a pet cemetery a mile from her parents' house, but she did. So on February 28th, 1984, Downs did not disclose to police that she owned a 22 caliber handgun. But both Steve Downs, the ex-husband, and Knickerbocker, who is also Nick, who was her love interest, informed them that she did. Investigators later discovered Downs bought the handgun in Arizona. While they were unable to find the actual weapon, they found unfired casings in her home with extractor markings from the murder weapon. Most damaging, witnesses saw her car being driven very slowly toward the hospital at an estimated speed of 5 to 7 miles per hour. I mean, you could probably jog quicker, contradicting her claim that she drove to the hospital at high speed after the shooting. Based on this and additional evidence, Downs was arrested on February 28, 1984, nine months after the shooting, and charged with one count of murder and two counts each of attempted murder and criminal assault. June 17, 1984, Downs was convicted on all charges on June 17, 1984 and sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years. She was required to serve 25 years before being considered for parole. Psychiatrist diagnosed her with narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders. Most of her sentence is to be served consecutively. The judge made it clear that he did not intend for Downs to ever be free again. Yeah, she's definitely a few fries short of Happy Meal. And they have it. Like, if Casey Anthony was to go see a psychiatrist and they were to diagnose her, it has to be maybe not the antisocial personality, but the narcissism is definitely there too with Casey Anthony. And it's there with Letitia Evil. Let's get into Diane Downs' marriage and her affairs and how her children came about and the children that came about that really some people do not know about. But let's start at the beginning. At the age of 14, Diane dropped her formal name, Elizabeth, for her middle name, Diane. She got rid of her childish hairstyle opting instead for a trendy, shorter, bleached blonde style. She began wearing more stylish clothing and that showed off her maturing figure. She also began a relationship with Stephen Downs 
a 16 year old boy who lived across the street her parents did not approve of Stephen or the relationship but that did little to sway Diane and by the time she was 16 their relationship had become sexual their long-distance relationship seemed to survive and in November 1973 with Stephen now home from the Navy the two decided to marry the marriage was rocky from the start fighting about money problems and accusations of infidelities often resulted in spurts of Diane leaving Stephen to go to her parents home in 1974 despite the problems in their marriage the Downs had their first child Christy six months later Diane joined the Navy but returned home after three weeks of basic training because of severe severe blisters Diane later said her real reason for getting out of the Navy was because Stephen was neglecting Christy having a child did not seem to help the marriage but Diane enjoyed being pregnant and in 1975 their second child Cheryl Lynn was born raising two children was enough for Stephen and he had a vasectomy this did not stop Diane from getting pregnant again but this time she decided to have an abortion she named the aborted child Carrie okay if that's not creepy Stephen you should have taken the kids right then and ran in 1978 the Downs moved to Mesa Arizona where they both found jobs at a mobile home manufacturing company there Diane began having affairs with some of her male co-workers and she became pregnant yes yet again and let me guess we know Stephen Downs is not the father in December 1979 Stephen Daniel Danny Downs was born and Stephen with a V accepted the child even though he knew he was not his father so she has a boy she knows that Stephen S-T-E-V-E-N is not the father but she names the son is it Stephen I hope it's Stephen but still too close yeah she's definitely um, a nutter butter so the marriage lasted about a year more until 1980 when Stephen and Diane decided to divorce that was probably a good thing but he should have would have could have I know of taken the children before we get back into the timeline let's get into her affairs and when did she fall in love with her boyfriend so Diane spent the next few years moving in and out with different men having affairs with married men and at times trying to reconcile with Stephen to help support herself she decided to become a surrogate mother but failed two psych psychiatric exams required for the applicants one of the tests showed that Diane was very intelligent but also psychotic a fact that she found funny and would brag to her friends about so in 1981 Diane got a full-time job as a postal carrier for the US post office maybe that's what made her go postal the children often stayed with Diane's parents Stephen or Danny's father when the children did stay with Diane neighbors voiced concerns about their care the children were often seen poorly dressed for the weather and at times hungry asking for food if Diane was unable to find a sitter she would still go to work leaving six-year-old Chris Christie in charge of the children in the later part of 1981 Diane was finally accepted into a surrogate program to which she was paid ten thousand dollars after successfully carrying a child to term they must have been hard up for parents or people were not 
surrogates and they needed to keep the income coming in because I thought she was psychotic. How would she even have passed the test to become a surrogate mother? After the experience, she decided to open her own surrogate clinic, but the venture quickly failed. It was during this time that Diane met co-worker Robert Nick Knickerbocker, the man of her dreams. The relationship was all-consuming, and Diane wanted Knickerbocker to leave his wife feeling suffocated by her demands and still in love with his wife nick ended the relationship devastated diane moved back to oregon but had not fully accepted the relationship with nick was over she continued to write to him and had one final visit in april 1983 at which nick completely rejected her telling her the relationship was over and that he had no interest in being a daddy to her children so is that what set Diane Downs off hmm let's get a back in to the timeline and we left off in 1986 Downs two surviving children eventually went to live with the lead prosecutor on the case Fred Hughie he and his wife Joe Ann adopted them in 1986 87 Downs briefly escaped in 1987 and was recaptured she is the subject of a book by Anne Rule and a made-for-TV movie based upon it, both called Small Sacrifices. She was denied parole in December of 2008 and again in December 2010. She is eligible to try again in 2020, which is now at the age of 65. July 11th, 1987, Downs was incarcerated at the Oregon Women's Correctional Center in Salem. She escaped on July 11th, 1987 and was recaptured just a few blocks from the prison on July 21st. She received an additional five-year sentence for the escape. After her recapture, Downs was transferred to New Jersey Department of Corrections Clinton Correctional Facility for women after heavy lobbying from Hughie. The Salem prison was located 66 miles from Hughie's home in Springfield. During her 10 days of freedom, Hughie had feared that Downs would attempt to travel there in hopes of contacting Christy or Danny. Despite significant security upgrades at the women's facility after the escape, state officials accepted Hughie's argument that the risk of harm to Christy and Danny in the event of another escape was too great for Downs to remain incarcerated in Oregon. Okay, I never knew about how Don Downs escaped or how that went down so I got a little nosy and decided to look and found this interesting piece of article so the man who hid the convicted child killer Diane Downs after she escaped from prison in 1987 said he should have turned her into police Wayne Safer Cipher told 2020 for the upcoming special on Downs that he was addicted to heroin when the single mother turned up at his door. Downs was sentenced in 1984, which we know, to prison for life plus 50 years for shooting her three children and killing one. 
So Downs escaped the Oregon Women's Correctional Center on July 11th, 1987 after scaling the fence while guards were not looking. I'm going to have to find a picture of that facility. Downs went to a home where a cipher was living with two friends. He recalled the day the convicted felon showed up at his doorstep. Cypher said the woman introduced herself not as Downs but as a girl with no clothes on. Imagine that little promiscuous Don Downs. He said the two had a sexual relationship while she stayed at the home. I was a nervous wreck, you know. I didn't see a sober minute. My only job was to keep her there, keep her from going out and harming anybody. I should have turned her in, but I didn't, Cypher said. Yeah, because he was probably getting some booty and figured why not since he was a heroin addict. Police were able to track down Dawn's thanks to a piece of paper she left in her cell. Well, she's not the brightest inmate in the cell, is she? The paper was blank, but FBI lab test revealed the indentation of the address of the house that someone had written on a piece of paper on the top of the blank sheet. You have to love forensics and how they do things. According to the Associated Press, one of Down's fellow inmates gave her the address of the home. Cypher said Downs was going to grab a BB gun and just go suicide by cop, but he talked her out of it, he said, and she went without a fight. Well, that was mighty and nice of you, Cypher. Back to the timeline. So, 1989 author Anne Rule wrote the book Small Sacrifices in 87, detailing Down's life and murder trial. The book documents accounts by friends, acquaintances, neighbors, and her surviving daughter Christy, who questioned the quality of her parenting, a made-for-TV movie also titled Small Sacrifices, starring Farrah Fawcett as Downs aired on ABC in 1989. 1994. Oh, let's go back. Sorry. Let's get there. 1994. In 1994, after serving 10 years, Downs was transferred to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. While in prison, she has earned an associate's degree in general studies. In 2010, she was located in the Valley State Prison for women in Chowchilla, California but transferred out when the facility was converted to an all-male institution in 2013. In her first application for parole in 2008, Downs reaffirmed her innocence. Over the years, she said, I have told you and the rest of the world that a man shot me and my children. I have never changed my story. Her first parole hearing was on December 9th, 2008. Lane County District Attorney Douglas Harsel Road wrote to the parole board. Downs continues to fail to demonstrate any honest insight in her criminal behavior. Even after her convictions, she continues to fabricate new versions of events under which the crimes occurred. He also wrote that she alternately refers to her assailants as a bushy-haired stranger, two men wearing ski masks, or drug dealers and corrupt law enforcement officials. Downs participated in the hearing from the Valley State Prison for Women. She was not permitted a statement, 
but answered questions from the parole board after three hours of interview and 30 minutes of deliberation, she was denied parole. December 10th, 2010, Downs faced her second parole hearing on December 10th. 2010 she was denied a parole and under a new law will not be eligible for parole another 10 years she has to wait to apply for parole until 2020 which it is 2020 right now when she will be 65 years old. Let me also show you the conspiracy theory facts, if some of you are conspiracy theories, or they may not be, but I had never heard of these few interesting little details. So let me get into them real quick. There are actually people who believe she is innocent. I have been looking through a lot of articles and papers and affidavits and I found something interesting about the gun. So right here they say according to the state ballistics evidence proved that Diane Downs was guilty. They claim to have found a two lead cartridges in Diane's rifle after the shooting, but there were discrepancies. The tool marks did not match and the detective lied on the stand. During closing arguments, Fred Hugi, Hugai, Hugu mentioned the Ruger model number and said he had the bill of sale, but it turned up at a police raid years later in Paris, California, where a detective involved in the case, Dick Tracy, had been employed prior to his move to Oregon, the gun did not match the ballistics from the shooting site. Ruger number 14-76187, Diane's gun was not the murder weapon. They tried to come up with another story to explain that it was not the gun after all, but the jig was up. It was proven in court that the shooter had to be left-handed to have been able to shoot the kids in the car at the right angle and Diane was right-handed. Hoogie Hoogie had to come to this realization during a demonstration at trial. Fingerprints at the crime scene were suppressed by the state. That right there is a little fishy. Police witness reports of strangers and confessions were suppressed and not pursued. Years later, seven witnesses signed affidavits telling of a man named Jim Haynes continuing confession that he was the shooter and the physical resemblance and he physically resembled the sketch. So there are definitely some conflicting statements back and forth with this trial and a lot of evidence that was suppressed. But what do you guys think? So let's touch on the shooting on Old Mohawk Road. After visiting a friend and looking at her new horse, Diane and her kids went for a drive. Not at all unusual for this family not living according to middle class rules. When the young ones fell asleep in the car, their mother decided to head home. She saw a man on the road and stopped thinking he needed help. Now, 
I don't think, well, back in the 80s, it was different, but with kids in the car sleeping, I probably would have kept going. Where was I? She saw a man on the road and stopped thinking he needed help. According to Diane, he shot her kids. She struggled with him and managed to escape after getting shot. She drove to the nearest hospital where the nursing staff and doctors attended to the children. The police were called in and her parents arrived promptly. Right away, the police asked her to go to the crime scene even though she did not want to leave her children behind. Her father also insisted she try to help catch the shooter. She unwillingly followed the cops in spite of being in pain and not wanting to leave the premises. In the nurse's notes, she is described as in shock and unable to grasp the situation. Most people described Diane's injury as minor or superficial, but in reality, it was a very serious injury. Her arm was severely damaged, so shattered that she needed a graft from a hip bone. A steel plate had to be attached to some lead fragments were removed. Her children were obviously more severely injured because being ca captive in the car while the shooter aimed at them gave them less of a chance to wiggle out of the situation than an adult outside the car. Diane's injury had to be quite painful as she had to be in shock while driving to the hospital and accompanying the detectives to the crime scene. So how she behaved at the time should not have been a factor influencing the authorities, but her behavior became the most important factor in the investigation that followed. What do you I just want to touch on one part of the investigation. The detectives took Diane to the crime scene and were able to retrieve shell cases on the ground where the incident happened. But strangely, they took no photos of the crime scene and did not lift fingerprints from the car. Diane's automobile was secured and examined and no gun was found. She also underwent a gun residue test that same evening that revealed that she had not held or shot a gun. She had no blood splatter or gunpowder residue on her hands, clothing, or hair, meaning she could not have been the shooter. So who watching thinks that Diane Downs is not guilty of shooting her children. I'm curious, is there anyone watching that thinks that? In order to reduce the demands made on her, she functions best in highly structured environments where she has a sense of control. She may be highly vulnerable of losing control of her emotions in emotionally charged situations, creating a faulty judgment and ineffective and inappropriate behavior. She keeps her emotions under tight control, presenting only socially acceptable feelings and bearing other contradictory feelings. As far as her innocence goes and the possibility of being paroled if she admitted her crime, Diane strongly maintains her innocence. She states, I did not shoot my children, and I can't say I did. It would not benefit you, my children, or society for me to perpetrate that lie. If I was of my, wait, if, or society,
it would not benefit you, my children, or society to perpetrate that lie. If I was of mind to manipulate the board by giving voice to the words they want me to utter, I'd have sold my soul two decades ago when the lies would have benefited me and my youth passed long ago. It's too late for me to call myself a murderer when I am not, just to purchase my freedom. I did not shoot my children. She goes on to say that she has deep regret and mourns the loss and death of her children. If it was not such a high-profile case, Diane Downs would have been paroled a long time ago, considering her good behavior and lack of priors. The parole board had an obligation to parole Diane between 1998 and 2002 if she could provide reasonable cause to show she was not a danger to society. According to Oregon law, this would have to be supported by a psychiatrist's report or a warden's letter and Diane provided both, but the parole board refused to hear her. She followed all the correct parole board procedures for two years with no hearing. She then went through the state circuit court habeas corpus relief for four years with no avail. She is nowhere near being paroled and if she admitted guilt, I am not even convinced they would release her. Her case was too public and they are afraid of a public a backlash. Some of this I actually it did not even know very interesting and I want to hear all of your thoughts on this case I want to know who thinks that she is guilty and who thinks that she is innocent I myself my opinion I think she shot her children she shot herself and then she was hoping to get back with her little boyfriend having no kids I think she is a narcissist manipulator sociopath and I honestly think that she is probably okay and comfortable living in jail because like she said her looks are gone alright guys with that it is a wrap make sure you drop your opinions comments below Thank you for watching. Please like or dislike whichever you prefer and subscribe. Everyone stay safe from a COVID-19 and if you or your loved ones have it or have gotten it, I hope everyone has recovered and have a great day or a great night wherever you are in the world and stay vigilant.